everyone. You know the guest of today's flashback episode from his iconic performances in Lost and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Here's Dominic Monaghan. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Hello, Anna. How's it going? Long time no see. I know. Was the last time the photo shoot that we did? I think so. Must have been like 2003. It was kind of a cool photo shoot. It was so opulent. I was wearing like jewels and gowns. Yeah, you looked incredible. And I think the vibe that they were looking for was like... We're in the business, but we're kind of over it. Like, we were all kind of like... Jaded, rich assholes. <laughs> it was weird because, like, I have no idea about Hollywood. I certainly didn't back then, and I really am not inclined to know anything about it that much now. So they were like, yeah, you guys are young and hot, and you're kind of having a little bit of a moment. So we're going to have you be these kind of, like, falling out of a nightclub, hanging out in a soft top car driving around Sunset Boulevard and I was like okay it's not really me but it looks good so (laughs) it was like what is this life I know but as actors I think we obviously are very malleable and chameleons and we can just kind of slot into it and it was a fun shoot but I do these Q&A's on Instagram probably every week or so where I just say how can I help and then people ask questions and if I can genuinely help then I will and then I'll just like answer sarcastically and put it kind of sideways sometimes so people know that I'm joking about stuff And someone asked me today, how do you handle the Hollywood life and being a Hollywood actor? And I said, well, I don't live in Hollywood. I very rarely go to Hollywood. And I don't consider myself to be a quote unquote Hollywood actor. I'm living in a part of the world that is the center of my business. But, you know, I'm not going to like the opening of bars or restaurants or going to red carpet premiere events or I know a few actors, but I spend most of my time not around actors. You know, I enjoy them. But there's a strange thing with actors, I think, where there's like an idea, a concept that we are in some way vapid. And I was like, oh, where does that come from? We lack structure or we lack something decent and grounded because we're in a business where obviously the biggest stories, the Cary Grants, the Humphrey Bogarts, the... Marilyn Monroe's, those lives are fantastic. But I think most actors are just like, I'd like to be going to work and providing for my family and doing a decent job. And it's not champagnes and lollipops, you know? I do. Yeah. I do know. I don't really enjoy that element of, I guess, performing as myself in those moments. I don't really love to get dressed up. I feel a little guilty saying this, but I embraced quarantine. (laughs) Right, right. I think I did too. Yeah. But you're married. You have kids, right? I have one kid biologically. He's just turned 10. And then I have two stepchildren that are 18 and 16. Lovely. I mean, the opportunity for you to spend more and more time with your family and in your little nest I think for a lot of people was fantastic during COVID, you know? I think for the most part, a nice way to reassess some things. Mm. You know, I don't talk about it much, but I left the show that I was on, Mom. Mm. And I started knitting. Oh, lovely. I'm not great. Oh, but I like those kind of loose knit hats. If I ever go into a shop where they're selling knitwear, scarves or sweaters or hats... I want the knitting that is almost starting to fall apart. You've got gaps in between it. I love that look of a knit, you know, so make me a hat. All right, I will. (laughs) Beautiful. I have a massive head. It's deceptive. It doesn't look big, but it's fucking huge. A lot of actors do, don't they? Dominic, if acting were deemed illegal, how would you make money? If I wasn't acting? Mm -hmm. What are your skill sets? Well, I'm a dive master, scuba diver, so I could take people out on boats. Okay, I like this. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing a nature show for like three years and quite a lot of that nature show was under the water. And my instructor, who also was the guy that I was kind of swimming alongside whilst commentating on the animals that we were seeing, said to me, hey, listen, Dom, obviously you're a qualified scuba diver, but if you go through this kind of eight to ten series of qualifications... You can come to any of the boats that I work on around the world and you can work for as long as you want on those boats and do it, you know, whenever. This is the best backup plan I've heard. It's brilliant. It might actually genuinely be my retirement plan. I'm not sure how I feel about retirement, but if 
you know, if it gets to a point where I think, okay, I've cracked this whip as hard as I'm ever going to crack it, then I might go do that. I love working with animals. I love working with young people. And I think like potentially taking anyone who shows up on the boat, but hopefully young people, young families, young kids, scuba diving is great. I find young people really inspiring to be around. Like what age? In terms of like education and animals and kind of opening up their scope to the natural world. I think maybe my favorite age is probably eight, nine, ten. They're interested. They're curious. They have a little bit of fearlessness because they've not quite been, you know, battered by the world yet. And you can expose them to things that a lot of people just kind of attach fears to. And if you get them at a young enough age, you know, we're not instinctually born with a fear of spiders or bats or snakes or sharks. We don't have that fear. Supposedly young people, young babies are scared of two things. They're scared of being on their own, being abandoned and falling because that obviously saves a baby's life, the ability to not fall and the ability to have a caregiver around. But they have no concept of a shark or a or a spider. These are just fears that our parents are unfortunately giving to us. So if you get them at a young enough age and get them curious about it, that's the thing. And you've got them, you know. My mom tells this story about advice that she was given when she was pregnant with me. I guess she was scared of a, I don't know if it was a cockroach or something like that. She was freaking out about a bug. And this lady said, don't you pass that on to your kids. Mm -hmm. And she didn't. You know, another one of these questions or concerns on this Q&A that I did recently, someone said, I'm scared of moths. What do I do? And moths are not uncommon for people to be scared of. I mean, it's not the most common animal for people to be scared of, but it's not uncommon. And I said to this lady, connect to the idea that a moth doesn't have the ability to hurt you. So outside of your kind of abstract fear of like, they're going to fly into my brain and lay eggs, or they're going to, you know, fly into my dress and live there and stuff, all of these like weird ideas that are not true, actually connect to the truth of it, which is that a moth does not have the ability to harm you. I mean, most moths don't even have mouth parts, so they don't even eat. They don't have the ability to eat, let alone bite. So really fear is an ignorance. And that's not me calling people ignorant. It's just simply that is the fact. If you're scared of something, you don't know enough about that thing to be exposed to the truth of the fact that, you know, it's really not that scary. Maybe it can be dangerous, but it doesn't have to be scary, you know. So very often with people when they have an irrational fear, I'm like, okay, that's fine. The irrational fear is something that we deal with by exposing you to the real truth of the matter. And then the irrational fear goes away. You know? Do you have any fears that some might deem irrational? I was a little scared of heights when I was younger, which was given to me by my mom. We did like a relatively strenuous hike, trek, walk, whatever, through the countryside of the north of England with my parents and my cousins. We kind of had to slightly scale a hill, but not really. I mean, you could do it standing up, but my mom's like, you know, crawling around on all fours as if she's like a mountain cat. And I just realized that she was very scared of heights and then it kind of got given to me. So over the years... You know, I just exposed myself to like the world's biggest bungee jump and did a lot of very high things when I was doing this nature show and put myself in high places and just kind of breathed in those moments. You know, it's okay to be scared of something. That's fine. It's okay to acknowledge the fear. What I always try and do is say, okay, that's fine. I see it. I'm experiencing it. But now I'm in the driving seat. I'm not going to let the fear dictate what I do next. I'm going to do something next, you know. And, and the more you expose yourself to that element of truth, the more it seems to go away. I mean, don't get me wrong. If I stand on the edge of a 100-foot drop, I'm definitely going to be a little bit more nervous than most people, but it's drastically improved over the years. How are you with the idea of handling rejection? I mean, certainly you and I and most actors are extremely adept at any level of rejection, whether that's being turned down by a partner or turned down at work or, you know, being treated poorly by someone in public and then just rejecting you. We're quite good at it because I spend probably a couple of times a week being rejected professionally by people. And I'm like, OK, great, fine. I'm really fascinated by scuba diving. I've been twice and I really enjoyed it. I liked how you can just kind of forget about everything down there. I find the evolution, technological evolution that we seem to be going down with this 
attachment to devices and relationships that live in our phone and interactions that live in our phone and all of these things, I find it really challenging to deal with. So all of the activities that I do that I love have nothing to do with my phone. So I'm big on gardening, don't have my phone with me. I'm big on meditation, don't have my phone with me. I like the gym, no phone. I like scuba diving, I like surfing, no phone. I like League of Legends, no phone. I like Magic the Gathering, no phone. So any of these activities that I do in my life has a strong correlation with not going into the phone land. I'm obsessed with nature. It's probably my spiritual practice. I don't really have a strong correlation with a God idea model, but that's obviously fine, you know, for everyone else to have their own idea of God. But what I believe in, where I go to, what I lean into, where I get my lessons from and understand, you know, where I am in my life, blah, 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 is usually the natural world. So outside of my garden, in forests, in deserts and stuff, of course, it's immersive, but the ocean is incredibly immersive because it surrounds you. It surrounds you. You know, you are literally in it. The noises are different and the animals are different. I think the animals obviously feel much more safer because you're in their world, not the other way around. I can get close to the animals in my garden, but I do that by standing still and being conscious of my breath and being conscious of my energy. But when you're scuba diving, the animals are just like, oh, you're fine. You can't get anywhere near us. You're nowhere near as fast as us. So you can have very intense connections. That's what I live for. I live with connections with the natural world. I can have a tiny fragment of a connection with an animal and it can kind of inspire the next kind of four or five days of my life, you know. Will you give us an example of an intense interaction under the water? The one that always springs to mind because it was kind of like otherworldly and a little transcendent was we were in a place called Palau, which is like the Cook Islands in the Pacific. And we were diving off like a shelf. So we were probably in about I don't know, 60 to 80 feet of water, but the shelf wow. dropped into infinity. Oh. Like when you looked over, it was just like a black hole. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. But what that becomes for animals is kind of a hunting ground because very often with smaller animals, they get disoriented with that drop off in the height difference. And they kind of swim around in this negative space, trying to understand where that shallow world is now. And the sharks are uh, kind of on the outside, just picking off animals and stuff. So we were doing some stuff with, with sharks and talking about the sharks and talking about the animals that were nearby. And out of the deep came this chambered nautilus. The chambered nautilus is a type of cephalopod, like an octopus or a cuttlefish, but it lives in a shell. Whoa! Yeah, it's spellbindingly beautiful. They live in very, very deep waters. And actually, if you bring them up to the surface, very often they die. So it was kind of unusual for this thing to come up. I was talking to my instructor, Pete, about sharks and talking to the audience about sharks. And then I said, oh, there's a Nautilus. And it just came up into the frame and was just like hanging around, just floating around, clearly interested in the camera, clearly interested in us, the very curious animal cephalopods. So I was able to, at that point, you know, obviously lose my marbles and talk about this chambered nautilus and have an interaction and it was allowing me to like hold it and it would just kind of rest and beautiful and you could see the eye was like it would be looking in different directions and then it would look directly at you and kind of have a little moment and then look away and yeah it was just very emotional experience with a highly unusual highly alien creature and when we were in between takes to make sure that we had got it I said to my instructor, Pete, who has made a career out of being a deep sea scuba diver, he'd been diving at that point for 45 years or something. I said, wow, that was amazing. How many Nautiluses have you seen? He said, I've never seen a Nautilus in my entire life. So he was having that moment as well. And it was a shared experience. So that's kind of stand out for me. How beautiful. Gorgeous. Once in high school, a teacher posed the question to us, what we thought was greater, our imagination or the reality. And of course, it's like we came up with the unicorn. It's like, this is ridiculous. Of course, of course, like we could never conceive of a chambered Nautilus. Yeah, yeah. I find that really interesting. I mean, look, I'm a science enthusiast. My father was a science teacher. My brother's a science teacher. I grew up in a science-based household and I very much lean back on science when I'm working with these animals. But When scientists are kind of putting forward ideas of aliens and could they exist here and could they exist there, they're always talking about carbon units. You know, they're like, well, 
there is no evidence that aliens could live there because there's no evidence of oxygen. There's no evidence of water. There's no evidence of carbon-based units. And I'm always like, well, an alien could be like a thought or a sound or a gas. You don't know what an alien is. An alien could be, of course, an almond or a piece of fluff or a mushroom, but an alien could be a concept. We don't know. We don't have the brain to think about it. I get asked a lot about intelligence, you know, what's the most intelligent animal on the planet? And I'm like, well, that's a tricky question totally. because we're always kind of thinking, well, we went to the moon and we built a computer, so we're the most intelligent animal. And you're like, yeah, but if you dropped you in the Amazon rainforest naked, you'd be dead in two days. An animal like a black panther can hunt in the dark, completely silent, can't see anything, can't hear anything, makes no noise at all, like hunting primarily on smell and is able to kill an animal four or five times its size. That is highly intelligent. We just don't recognize it, you know? Do you ever listen to Radio Lab, that podcast? Yeah, I like Radio Lab. Did you hear the one about the killer whales versus humpbacks? Is this them hunting humpbacks or they're comparing intelligence? It's fascinating, but it's this observed behavior of humpback whales saving creatures, seals, mm. walruses, from killer whale attacks. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's great. Oh, I'll check it out. It's amazing. It's humbling, you know? Yeah, both of those animals are incredibly charismatic and super cool. I'm always pitching ideas for nature shows and people say like, will you ever run out of ideas? And I'm like, well, there's not enough animals for me to run out of. I would love to like free dive with whales and with killer whales, which would be kind of a breathtaking experience. In fact, I did a, I did a show in Mozambique about whale sharks and the marine biologist that we were working with, we spent like, you know, 10 days, two weeks with, and one night we were having dinner and I said, what's the craziest thing that's happened to you under the ocean? We're all sharing these kind of war stories. And she'd been working off the coast of Mozambique with whale sharks for like three or four years. She said that she was on the bottom of the ocean shooting whale sharks from underneath them, just watching them kind of like sail over her, like the ship in Star Wars, just trying to get the enormity of these creatures. And suddenly the whale shark that she was recording just flipped its tail a few times and was gone, just disappeared. And she was like, hmm, that doesn't tend to happen with whale sharks. What's going on? And as she turned 180 degrees, there was a killer whale right here just floating in space. Oh, God! Yeah. And she said it was like, you know, the size of a truck, just looking at her. And I was like, what did you do? She said, I just froze. I was terrified. I thought it was going to eat me. And then it just zoom, disappeared and went after the whale shark. I was like, wow, that's pretty intense. That is wild. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. Yeah, like wearing a mask in a grocery store is oddly disorienting. I find myself like running into things. And that feeling is totally amplified underwater. Yeah, for sure. And the lack of sound. Yeah, it's sensory overload. And one of the ways, because obviously I've been in classes now that have been teaching people to get their scuba diving qualification. And one of the ways that you can find people that will qualify and the people that are going to struggle is, of course, it's overwhelming. You're wearing an extraordinary amount of gear. It's very heavy. It's alien. You go into an alien environment, different auditory things are going on, different visual things are going on. What you need to be able to do is problem solve when you are overwhelmed by a lot of stimuli. And the people that can do that will usually qualify. And the people that panic and can't do that are the people that will generally struggle. It is a goal of mine to get comfortable enough under the water. Great. How old were you when you first fell in love? I think I was 17. I mean, I had like crushes and stuff at school. You know, I had a crush on a girl called Nicola Savage. That's a great name. Yeah, that's cool, right? Nicola Savage. She was a savage as well because she was my first kiss. And I had a crush on like... Rachel McCarthy and Anna Lancaster and Kathy Barrett and people like that. But these were just kind of like, you know, silly little crushes. But then I went to college in Manchester, a college called Aquinas, studying theatre studies and English lit and geography. And in my kind of form class and also in my theatre class was a girl called Natalie, who I felt like head over heels in love with, really hadn't kind of experienced that before. And... um you know, young love, kind of 17, it all kind of spilling out of you. I assume you were in a relationship with Natalie? Yeah, we were kind of off on for probably a year and a half. And then I left to go start working. But it probably set a slightly unfortunate precedent with me and women, whereby we were in love. 
we felt very deeply for each other. And then, you know, it didn't really work out. And then we broke up. I'm not really sure why. I think we probably just kind of got too big for our boots. I probably thought, well, if I can get a girlfriend like Natalie, who was, you know, smoking hot. And I was like, well, that must mean that some of these other girls at this college must be into the idea as well. Yeah, I was only 17. I think I wanted to like see what else was out there. So we broke up for her probably feeling the same way as I did. And then we did that awful thing where she was like, okay, well, then I'm going to be with your friends to piss you off. And I was like, oh, well, if you're doing that, then I'll go be with your friends to piss you off. And then it became this very kind of like toxic. Like competitive. Yeah. And then we would get back together. There's this place called the Student Union, which was the only place that someone like me could go drinking in Manchester because I looked about 12 when I was 17 and it was the only place that would let me in. So she would be there with like one of my friends in a corner snogging you know smooching and stuff and like looking over at me i was like oh god so now i have to go find someone that she knows to snog then we'd meet halfway on the dance floor and be like oh i've made a massive mistake i still love you and then we'd like snog and we'd be back together for like a week and then it'd break up again and oh god it was awful we're still friends though i know her kids and everything so that's lovely that's amazing yeah we're still pals can you share experiences with actors that you've learned from I think the ones that stand out, the ones with the most amount of kind of effortless talent, have a real grasp on the subtlety of the job. You know, I think probably at the top of the list, in terms of just their skill set, because there are obviously actors that are really good at certain things. I was lucky enough to work with Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds on X-Men, and they're deeply charismatic men. They pop through the camera. They're very funny. They're very engaging. They're great with their crew. They're movie stars. That's a skill. You know, that's something that seems effortless and seems something that doesn't require any work. But that's something that they've worked out how to do. It's true, but you're right that it is an important one. Yeah, I think you do need it to navigate your way through this business. And especially if you are setting up your stall as someone like Hugh Jackman or Ryan Reynolds or, let's say, The Rock, who is all about charisma, his whole thing is, I'm super charismatic and you want to spend time with me. So that's a skill. But in terms of acting, the actual craft of acting, the top of the list for me was probably Ian Holm, who played Bilbo in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, very famous for being in the kind of original Alien film and just a profoundly skilled actor, very sensitive man, not necessarily in terms of you upsetting him, but in terms of his ability to kind of just read what's going on in the room and kind of break down a scene. I worked with him a few times, obviously, when all the hobbits are kind of leaving Middle Earth. I'm in that scene with him. We're in the scene at the start of the film in a kind of big party that's going on. And then in Rivendell, we're all hanging out. God, I love it when you talk about this. <laughs> I'm such a fan. Uh, oh, that's cool. And I oh, had no God. idea. Oh, oh that's yeah. Cool. I am all about the fantastical worlds. Uh, I like fantasy, too. So I got a phone call once when we were in the middle of shooting from Pete Jackson, who said, hey, Dom, Andy Serkis is in London recording his voice as Gollum. But Ian Holm is here and we need to cover his angle of the scene where he finds the ring in Gollum's cave. And since Andy's not here and Pete knew that I did a pretty OK impression of Gollum, he was like, will you come in and just stand in as Andy? We just want you to just be a template for Andy. You don't need to do anything crazy. And I obviously jumped at the chance because it was a scene just with myself and Ian Holm, who was just, you know, the loveliest man. And... Watching him at close distance was a pretty sobering experience. He came prepared, obviously. He never did the same take twice, but he knew where Pete was going to cut it. So instead of doing different takes, when Pete's going to choose a single or a two-shot or a master, in one master, he's looking in that direction, and then the other master, he's looking in that direction. So now Pete's in a situation where he can't choose... He wouldn't. He would know exactly where Pete would be like, oh, okay, so in this shot, you're going to feature the tombs. So I'll match that. But then later on, I'll change in those places where I, you know, his ability to like control and work with his voice and the sensitivity of his voice. You know, there's a lot of doubt in Bilbo in that moment. He's in a dark cave. He found a mysterious item. There's a monster of some sort kind of haunting him. So there's a lot of doubt and fear. And Ian was able to just get across that kind of, 
vulnerability and sensitivity just with little tiny noises and tiny like choices that he would make with his hands and stuff. He was just a very talented guy. Just awesome. Yeah, he was a really gorgeous man. And we were lucky enough to do this Josh Gad kind of get together of all the cast during COVID, this kind of charitable get together thing. And unfortunately, Ian was kind of coming towards the end of his life at that point. So we all jumped on. The entire cast was there. And Ian's wife at the time jumped on very quickly and said, hey, unfortunately, Ian's in bed. He's not feeling too great today. But he did send you a letter. And she, like, read out a letter from Ian. And we were all just, like, destroyed. It didn't make the show because, obviously, it was a private moment. But we were all just destroyed in that moment because he was such a kind of central heart of that group, you know, and just a breathtaking actor. Really brilliant. Well, so on the subject of heartbreak, will you tell us about a heartbreak in your life and potentially how you move through it, which usually is the same answer, which is just time. (laughs) Yeah, it's unfortunate, (laughs) isn't it, that time thing? Yes, it sure is. I mean, I think I've only really got my heart broken once in my life. I was dating an actress on Lost called Evangeline Lilly, who, you know, has gone on to have a name all of her own. And yeah, you know, I don't really know how she would explain the narrative. But from my point of view, it was probably the first time in my life that I was just kind of all in, you know. I was just like, okay, I'm in. Like, there's nothing that I'm really that keen on changing. And we were obviously exploring, you know, kids and marriage. And I knew her parents and she knew mine. And I didn't really have any doubts or questions or concerns at that point in time. You know, I was a lot younger than I am now, 26, 27, something like that. I think I had an extraordinary amount of growing to do in terms of handling my substances and handling my choices. I mean, obviously, if you grow up in England, you're usually drinking alcohol by the time you're 15 or 16. And that's not like a glass of wine or a pint of beer. That's like getting absolutely wankered on a Friday and Saturday night and maybe a Sunday afternoon. So even though I got my work done and I was at that point a very committed actor to the show Lost, I would only consider it a weekend if I, you know, was drunk out of my mind on a Friday night and a Saturday night. And I thought that was normal. And I had a huge amount of growing to do in terms of what was normal and what wasn't normal. And I think if you are drinking often, probably your behavior and your choices and your mood is up for debate. And I think Evie was pretty straight down the middle. You know, I think she was pretty solid. Of course, she enjoyed a glass of wine, but I rarely saw her get inebriated. And of course, she enjoyed a party and all that kind of stuff. But I was always the guy that wanted more. I always wanted to drink more, take more, stay up the latest, go on benders. And I just thought that she was okay with that. And I think probably she was consistently exploring the idea of like, well, this is okay for a time, but you know, he's not going to be a great dad or a great husband because he's got all this work to do, which I certainly did. So outside of me knowing it, I think she was kind of looking around to see what else was an option. And unfortunately, there was a little bit of a crossover which was pretty upsetting for me. And it just kind of exploded in my face, you know. I mean, it exploded in my face in like an awful way because, you know, not only do you go through a public breakup, because at the time that TV show Lost was kind of a big deal around the world. So it was kind of known that we were together and then known that we were not together. But I also left that show and then came back. I really, really appreciate you talking about that. As you were talking about it, I wonder how much of a, surprise it came to you, the ending. I've been in relationships where I have felt like, oh, this feels unsolvable. Like I've definitely tried to make a bad thing work for a long time. Right, right. But the two instances I'm thinking of, it took the guy by total surprise. And it felt like, man, 
you didn't take me seriously, I guess. Mm. But that's also youth, you know? Yeah. I mean, to say I was devastated is an understatement. You know, I had to be told by a third party of like, you do realize that she's with this guy when we were together. And I was like, wait, what? And this person was like, yeah. Who was this messenger? I genuinely think that they were trying to help because they were just kind of like, you don't have all of the facts and we do. And there's kind of a chance that you know, the island of Oahu is laughing at you. And I was like, oh, well, thank you for the transparency. Is that a direct quote? The island, the island of, of Oahu, Oahu is, is laughing, laughing at, at you? Well, no, but I mean, you know, we filmed last the, you know, it's a small island. We filmed in every location, every beach. That crew was everywhere. And, you know, everywhere that you went, I just kind of felt like, oh, so the entire film crew knew and we're keeping a secret for her. And I just kind of would show up and be like a monkey's asshole, you know? So, so there was that. But I mean, well, two things. So I think the moment where I was like, you have to sort your shit out was, this is kind of weird to admit, but it just, it just happened. This is just the truth. I woke up one time on my kitchen floor. This is years ago. This is like in the middle of the breakup, probably, I don't know, two or three months into this breakup. I woke up on my kitchen floor, didn't know what time it was. All my house was like black. It was clearly like, you know, the sun had gone down. And I was surrounded by pills, like a blue one, a red one, some white ones, a green one, a pink one, half a one, and just general detritus of clearly just a mess. And I was messed up, you know, kind of medicated and didn't know what medication I'd been on. And I kind of sat up and push myself next to this kitchen counter and tried to kind of sober up a little bit. And I looked at this mess in front of me and I thought, that could have been it. Do you know what I mean? You could have accidentally taken the wrong cocktail of stuff mixed with alcohol, mixed with where your head's at, and it it could have been it. You're not going to die over this. Like, of course, it's sad and you're devastated about it, but you're not going to die. So at that point, it was like a big turning point. And then, you know, I started doing a lot of work with, you know, plants and animals in terms of, you know, growth on it. That takes incredible strength. Yeah. I mean, what are your options? Your options are you either let it kill you or you come out of it. It's so hard to distract yourself, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I was chatting with my friends, Will and June, a few weeks ago about it, and they're married, happily married. But my friend Will had gone through a really tough breakup. And he said this thing where, I was like, yeah, it is that. That's one of the things that's really devastating about these types of situations. My friend Willard said, was it sad for you back then? Because you know you profoundly well, and you know the potential of what you could have been as a father and a husband and someone who would have, because obviously at this point in my life, I have got to grips with, you know, when or when I shouldn't be drinking alcohol or when I shouldn't be partying. And, you know, I kind of like done a lot of work on myself and figured it out. And he said, is it the sadness of the potential of what it could be? And I think there's something in that. I've broken up with girls before. And when I've looked at it, I've thought, well, she's a lovely person, but it was never going to work. It was just never going to work. There were things that weren't going to work out. But certainly when I was with Evie, I was like, this is fine. The little things that, you know, we're working on, we will figure out and we will make beautiful shapes with each other into eternity. And I think like losing that potential was super sad, but it also got me to where I am as a person. So I'm very happy that it all happened, you know. What's your relationship with love now? It's probably the number one thing that I'm the most positive about in my life. And I challenge a lot of people to kind of not lose hope and not feel like it's messed up. You know, I have a friend who's going through a breakup right now and she kind of said to me, I feel like if it didn't work out with this guy, it's never going to work out. And I immediately just said, you can't have that mindset with love. You have to be naive and playful and open and honest about it because that's how it works. That's the exchange, you know, like you can be cynical about money and you can be mindful about who you spend your time with and things like that. But in terms of love, you just have to kind of surrender, see what happens. I think LA is a very tricky place to be dating because everyone's just the coolest person in the world and doing their own thing. And that's fine. Obviously, I've dated while I've been here and it's been a little uh, underwhelming. But I also enjoy my own company and I have a ton of animals and a big garden and You know, that's the other thing with love is that I want it to be effortless. I don't want to work at it. You're going to work later when there's a mortgage and when there's bills and when there's arguments that you need to get through. But in terms of the initial moonlight and roses thing, I want it to knock me off my feet and overwhelm me and be a beautiful thing. Ah, 
That is just rad. Hi, Renee. How are you? Good. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Renee, this is Dom Monahan, and he is awesome. Just fantastic. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Renee, would you mind telling us what's going on? Sure. So basically, in like high school, I never got into like dating. I never felt any sort of like sexual attraction at all. So I found out what asexuality is, and I was like, okay, I think that might be me. And then I got to college, and I was like, yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> So I never dated anybody except for the guy I'm now married to. Didn't start dating until I was like 21, I guess. And he's the only guy I've ever kissed, the only guy I've ever slept with. And so when I met him and I was like super into him, like I want to hold his hand. I want to like sit close to him on the couch. I was like, oh, sweet. I'm straight. This is great. We started having sex about six months after we started dating And so we've been having sex for like, I guess, like seven years. And it's like, oh, everybody tells you when you're a woman that when you start having sex, it's not going to be great. So I was like, okay, it'll take time. And then it was like, it's not getting better. And basically over the years, what I've like concluded is that like, I am in fact asexual. I don't experience any sort of like physical drive to have sex. Like I consume erotic media, but like when it comes to the actual act of having sex, I'm really just not into it. And it's not that I hate it. It's not like I'm uncomfortable. It's not that I'm not, I, I consent, like he's never pressured me or anything. And like, I like the feeling of being close to him, but like physical sensation wise, it just like honestly doesn't do much, if anything, for me. The question I have or the advice I'm looking for is how or should I communicate with him? Because he is great. That is awesome. (laughs) Yeah, I'm really lucky. Like he always wants me to feel good and like take care of me before he's going to take care of himself. And he's always like, please tell me what you want me to do. Like, what are we doing here? So he's fantastic. So I really honestly don't think it's an issue of like, we need to communicate better because he's not listening to what I'm saying feels good. But I think the issue is that I feel dishonest sometimes when we're having sex, because I'm like, I'm not just going to not say anything. So like I say, like, oh, you know, that feels good. Please keep doing that. And I think when I'm saying like, that feels really good. What I actually mean is like, I feel that like I'm getting a sensation and like, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I think a lot of our listeners will be able to very much relate. So I'm really grateful that you're so open Let me just ask a couple of preliminary questions. So you do experience orgasm. Yes, I do. It took me a long time to start experiencing that. But in the last like year, I would say it's like more regular, like almost every time we have sex. Oh, that's amazing. Great. But before it was like maybe once or twice a year. (laughs) But even that, I don't necessarily think it feels pleasurable I think more than like physical pleasure, it's like a sense of accomplishment almost. I kind of want to know a little bit about your communication levels. I am so happy for you, though. Like you totally lit up when you started talking about your husband. That is just Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Do you tend to say like, I'm not in the mood or the question isn't about your response. But when I read your letter, I was thinking about how special it is that you guys have known each other for so long and have been only intimate with each other. And thinking about like the patterns of communication that we get into, especially around tougher topics, it made me think about that a little bit. So I kind of wanted to explore that area. Yeah, so we honestly don't have sex that often. He's also in like a really stressful place with where his job is right now. But like, this isn't a new issue though. Like that's more of a new thing with him being stressed at work. So maybe once every two weeks, maybe less. But I would say sometimes it's just like we get into bed and we are like cuddling and then it just like kind of progresses. Like he's like a little handsy and I'm like, okay, this is (laughs) happening. Um, Or sometimes like we'll be sitting on the couch and like one or the other of us be like, hey, I uh, 
kind of want to have sex too. Is that cool? And it's like, yeah, let's do that. So yeah. Okay. All right. Good to know. Dom, what are your thoughts here? (laughs) I mean, it does sound like you guys are communicating really well, which is key. You know, lots of times in these situations, I'm always interested in like, okay, so where's the breakdown in communication? But it seems like you guys are communicating relatively well. You had said that, you know, you kind of have an interest in like erotica or like different things that turn you on. Is that something that you guys share or that is something for you and then your husband is into something else because I wonder if maybe you could find a common ground he's not really into it he's not against it like he's like I think that's great that you have that but usually what I'll try to do is like if we've been talking about having sex like when we go to bed we're gonna have sex I'll like try to do that before we go to bed I'll spend some time kind of getting myself turned on with that before the sex actually starts if you have that, you have your own individual kind of erotica thing. Does he have something where you're like, oh, I don't really mess around with that. That's his thing. Not that I know of. No. Well, okay. I like it that you can get turned on. What's tough right now is that you mentioned that your husband's going through something rough in his job. Mm-hmm. That could be playing a huge factor, you know? So I wonder if the answer is both communication. It has to be communication. Like, how much of this story have you told him? Oh, he knows. He knows that I identify as asexual. And just to clarify, like, that can mean a lot of different things. Oh, yeah. I totally need an education. (laughs) I mean, it's kind of like a whole spectrum in and of itself. Like, some people identify as, like, sex repulse, where they want nothing to do with it. Okay. Like I said, I definitely have a very strong, like, sense of romantic attraction, like, separate from any sort of physical attraction. What do you think your husband would say if you asked him tonight, do you wish we had sex more often? I think he'd say yes, because it seems like every time we have sex, one or both of us is like, we need to do this more often. And then it's like three more weeks. (laughs) Yeah. I had a friend who was kind of in a funk with his partner. He said the same thing to me. He was like, we just kind of don't really have sex that much. And then the next sentence out of his mouth was, but whenever we do, it's really great. And I was like, well, why don't you just slap on a fake smile and just say, all right, every Thursday we're doing it. And we'll just kind of get into that rhythm thing. The other thing I was going to say is like, sometimes variety can be the spice of life, you know? So I don't know what you guys' situation is and what your options are. But, you know, sometimes if you've been with someone for a long time, going out to, you know, have dinner or going and having a sunset glass of wine or, you know, a walk on the beach or a walk through a forest and stuff, it can just kind of loosen up some of these tropes that we find ourselves in, which is like, we go to bed, if we touch each other in a certain way, that means it's a signal that we're going to have sex. You can kind of get yourself out of that where you're like, you know, I very much enjoy having sex in my laundry room. Because uh, it doesn't happen that often. But if I can have sex in my laundry room, I'm like, wow, this is like really spicy because it's normally in my bedroom. And now I'm like next to the washer dryer. This is crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Feels so illicit, naughty. Yeah, give it a go. (laughs) Also, another thing to keep in mind is like, I think we are all susceptible to this idea that wherever we are at in our life, that's it. Yes. That's what's happening and that is what's going to happen, you know? We attach permanence. Right, and it's always changing. You know, I have a little nephew and I remember talking to my brother recently and I said, you know, do you and your wife get an opportunity to like go out for dinner and stuff? And he said, oh no, there's no chance we have to be in with the kid. That's just life. And I was like, well, that's life right now. But in 18 months time, it could be completely different. So it's also probably important for you to connect to the idea that if this is your lifelong partner and you guys are going to do beautifully romantic things like get old together and have grandchildren and all that kind of stuff, which is beautiful and is attached to love and is attached to intimacy and relationships and stuff. Those things come in waves, you know, sometimes you're having sex and it's crazy for a few weeks and then it kind of tapers off. A friend of mine was telling me last night that, you know, he was like, I'm kind of struggling with a little bit of an addiction to porn and I don't really know what to do about that. And I was like, you know, if you'd have asked me that question when I was in my early 20s, I would have given you a different answer. But now that I'm in my mid 40s, it's different. And it might be a completely different answer in my mid 50s. So I was like, don't give yourself a hard time. At the moment, you seem to be struggling with it. But it could all change in a year. It could all change in 18 months. Completely. 
sometimes situations will change on their own and sometimes changing things just takes a little effort. I, but I want to get back to the idea of your husband's stress and if you think it might be affecting your overall intimacy. Yeah. And I think that probably has to do with like having sex maybe a little less often. And I definitely see what you mean about like defining the difference between the right now and forever. You know, I think arguably, even though it's happening maybe like every two or three weeks instead of every week, quality of sex is probably better than we've ever been having. And so it's like, well, it is getting better. That's great. Right. Well, I'm, (laughs) you know, I guess I'm glad that seven years in, I've like figured out something. What was your childhood relationship with sexuality? Yeah, (laughs) that's the other thing. We were both raised very conservative Christian, very much purity culture. In college, when I was like, am I asexual or am I just a victim of purity culture? Because I was always like praised in high school for not dating. And it's like, oh, well, she's too busy with school. And I was like, no, I just honestly don't see the appeal. Like it wasn't a conscious decision on my part. But no, there was a ton of shame around sex in my household and in my head. Me too. I mean, man, I grew up in a lax Roman Catholic house, went to Roman Catholic school. And, you know, religion has a lot to answer for. Like, if there is a God out there, something truly bigger and more extraordinary than we could imagine, he wants us to be having sex. That is an act of love and intimacy. And it like is changing the world. The clitoris is like <laughs> proof of something. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I was raised basically one step away from Mennonite. Oh, so. gosh. Oh, okay, so this makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a work in progress. I still have a lot of trauma that I'm working through for other things about growing up in that religion. So, oh, Renee, it's connected. I know. Totally. <laughs> I have a question, Renee, like just out of interest, that first kind of six weeks or so at college, when you are being exposed arguably for the first time to very liberated teens who are having casual sex and drinking alcohol and doing drugs and stuff, were you absolutely horrified by what you saw initially? So yes and no, definitely had my first panic attack the first week of college. And I was talking to one of my friends about this today because I was telling them that I was going to be talking to you all. And both of them who are in long-term committed relationships were like, girl, the same. Like we would have the same question, which made me feel really good. But the point of that being, I was telling my good friend that I kind of wish I'd made a wider variety of friends in college because I was so freaked out and scared by the kind of liberal environment that I surrounded myself, at least for the first couple of years with like Christian groups. So I didn't have other people in my life that I could talk to at all about sex or anything like that. So yes, I guess I was very horrified and immediately just like shied away and found another like little insular place. And then luckily got connected to a very liberal campus ministry who was like super sex positive. Like they were the only campus ministry that had a booth at Pride. Oh, good. Oh yeah, it was great. I was involved with them. And then even after I stopped identifying as Christian, still remained in touch. It's hard to shed that early influence. I mean, how I attempt to do it, I really like to play characters. One of my favorites is a sex worker in Amsterdam. (laughs) Super high paid. (laughs) Lovely, lovely, Anna, lovely. Yeah, thank you, yeah. But the reason why I think I like the sex worker fantasy is because it feels very liberating. It feels like this is a person who knows what they're doing. And I get to lose myself in that idea of sexual power as opposed to the sexual powerlessness that I was raised with. Mm, Yeah, that's cool. That makes a lot of sense. My one is um, I like to be a mechanic, and uh, and the the girl's a car. Okay, so she's, she's, she's coming. She's coming for a service. Now we don't know. It could be the windshield wipers are broken, or possibly the exhaust is faulty. You have to get underneath and have a look. And like I'm joking, of course, but I also think like some element sometimes of just like the playfulness in the bedroom without taking it out of an earnestness and just being like, you know what? Let's just see. This could be kind of silly, but it's only the two of us and we're naked anyway. So let's just have some fun. (laughs) I like not taking it quite as seriously in the bedroom. Oh, totally. And I think that the environments that we were raised in, Renee and I, like, it's hard to be playful 
It's hard to enjoy it. It's hard to feel like, oh, I'm going to make my body feel really good. Yeah. How much do you touch each other, like holding hands or... A lot. Good. We're very like touchy. And that's something new with me because in like high school up through college, honestly, until we started dating before my senior year of college, I like was very much like, don't hug me to anybody. And I think it was honestly because... I identified any sort of physical touch with sexual touch. Mm -hmm. And so even like my best friends who would like want to walk down the hallway of high school holding hands because that's what girls do. I was like, I can't hold your hand. Like it made me so physically uncomfortable. But then I was like, oh, I like holding your hand. (laughs) And now I like want to hug my friends. (laughs) Good, good. Uh, This is awesome news. Yeah, you're on that journey. I want to ask you this. Do you wish that you would be more intimate more frequently? Yes and no. Okay. Will you elaborate? So I think the frequency of sex is less important to me than having just like quality time together. And so like, I wish it would happen more frequently, but mostly because that would mean that both of us are in a more like relaxed mental state. Yeah. If that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. And it's like I said, basically every time we have sex, it's like, we should do that more. (laughs) The great thing is that you and your husband know each other because it sounds like you have done the work. In your letter, you wrote that you've read books. And I wonder if it's going to take time. I mean, I didn't feel pretty sexually free until I was in my 40s. Okay. I was really like weirdly devastated if a partner watched porn. I don't know why I took that hard. I think it's all wrapped up in everything. But anyway, you have this rare opportunity to really have your husband know who the entirety of you is. Yeah. And the next growth-like stream for you guys can be through this vulnerable dialogue. And you can tiptoe in. It's okay. (laughs) My advice would be the goal being you guys totally understand each other, you know? Yeah. And there's nothing abnormal about you. So many of us have the backpack of shame. I know that I didn't give you really specific advice. Oh, I actually think this has been an incredibly helpful conversation. Oh, good, good. Especially the part about recognizing it's a process and it's a journey. Because I think when I've been worrying about this and like when I wrote in, I think I was picturing this conversation as either I say nothing and just keep worrying about it in my head and like trying to make it better for myself or basically saying like, hey, sex doesn't feel good and I don't think it's going to change. And then I was worried how he would react if he'd be hurt and like if we'd ever have sex again. And so now I'm like, no, that's not how it has to be. So thank you very much. I'm so glad. (laughs) You'll get a lot of reward if he knows the entirety of you. Yeah. Renee, please know that our listeners and myself are really grateful for your honesty about this because you're not alone. Yeah, this has been fantastic. Thank you both so much. Good. No, thank you so much. Hey, Renee. Thanks so much. What about the best or worst advice you've received? Okay, well, the best advice that I've ever got, it's such a simple thing, but it's... I think sometimes the best ideas are the most simple and universal and it works everywhere and it just never trips you up. It's always helpful is to be kind. You know, I know it can be tricky at times and when someone's kind of triggering you and being unkind or rude or dismissive, it's difficult to be kind. But, you know, the bigger version of yourself would tell you that if you want to solve this issue, this communication issue that's going on right now with this person or soften the experience for the two of you, it's just to be kind. You know, just kind of come back at them with kindness. Just kind of ask them a kind question or make a kind inquiry as opposed to mirroring their level of aggression or inappropriateness, you know. So the people I admire the most, whether that's in kind of world history or even in fiction or the people that I've met in my life who I think, man, they're doing something right. They're always the kindest, you know. Okay, Moriarty, give it to me. All right, so Moriarty, The Devil's Game is on Audible. It is an audio podcast, comes out in chapter form, you know, similar to an audio book. 
It's the story of Professor James Moriarty, who is Sherlock Holmes's kind of arch nemesis in the world of Arthur Conan Doyle. So I sat down with the production company probably two or three years ago now, and we were exploring a few projects. And one of them was that, you know, the second most charismatic character in the Sherlock Holmes world is his nemesis. He's a genius. He's a chess grandmaster. He's a profound mathematician, paranoid, violent, has issues with women, has issues with authority. And I just said, what if we just flip it? What if the whole world just gets flipped? So now Sherlock is the bad guy. And Mariotti, he's like justified in his actions. And, you know, he's been accused of crimes that he didn't commit type thing. So we kind of busted through that idea and turned it into a show, which seems to have found an audience, which is fantastic. And Billy Boyd is in that with me too, which is always a joy. I love that. All right, and Moonhaven. Moonhaven is a show that I did for AMC. We shot in Dublin. We're going to go back and shoot the second season sometime soon for AMC+. Plus. It's the story of in the future... The Earth has become relatively uninhabitable and there is a community of people on the moon, the best and the brilliant and the most kind of kind and sweet people. So because of that, they've created a kind of utopia, a heaven of sorts. And over the course of two or three generations, there have been no crimes that have occurred. There's nothing for the police to do. I play a police officer who is essentially kind of a community leader, helping kids on their way to school, making sure that old ladies get their shopping on time, bringing down cats from trees. And for the first time ever on the moon, a series of murders take place. And I am an inept detective trying to figure out who is murdering whom. Inept? It's slightly inept because he's never dealt with a murder before. He's never dealt with a serious crime. Probably the most serious crime that he dealt with is kids smashing a window when they were playing a sports game. That's about it, you know. So I wonder if then not being sort of a hardened homicide detective, the emotional impact of witnessing a dead body. Yeah, I kind of tried to just maintain a stance of relative naivety and the character that I play, Paul Sarno, just trusts everyone, trusts that no one is lying to him. You should take on their word that people are going to make the right choices, do the right thing. And he is consistently exposed to Earthers who have come to the moon who don't do the right thing and are only serving themselves. And he has to wake up out of his own dream and realize that things are not what they seem. And certainly the way that he explores murder is from a place of just genuine naivety and it's quite sweet to see that. I've played a lot of naive characters. Mm, what's that about, Anna? It's my specialty. Hey, Alex. Hello. Thank you for your letter and you're here with Dom Monahan, who is just awesome. What's up, Alex? I'm good. Will you tell us what's going on? So this actually comes in the nick of time. I'm going to be going to Chicago to basically spend time with a guy that I somewhat dated last fall. Still have a little bit of feelings for him. I feel like it might be mutual. And so I'm just trying to like deal with the nerves of how do I approach this? Should I talk about it with him beforehand? Should I just let it happen natural and see what goes on? So in your letter, you write that you had a relationship with... Yeah. What would you like to call him? We'll call him Ryan. Ryan. You were in a relationship before, but it was... Yeah, it kind of got derailed because both of us have had traumatic past. Like for me, it was dealing with a little bit of being premature as a baby and then also previous sexual assaults that kind of like impeded bonding with humans and stuff like that. On his part, he also went through a little bit of a nasty divorce. You guys were coming into it with a lot of stuff. A lot of baggage. And it sounds like because you guys had those intense conversations that you guys were really intimate with each other and things were very passionate. Yeah. Because that's usually when you get this happen to me and this is my story, which is a good thing. I think it was definitely a good thing. Like we ended things amicably and we didn't exactly close the chapter as per what his last text to me was before we just became friends. And then we went for a couple of months and we hung out again and things were very handsy, very touchy-feely, cuddly. It was very cute. And when we parted, he kissed me. And so that's part of why I'm kind of thrown for a loop because I'm like, what does this mean? Did he break up with you? He initiated it because he wasn't ready to be in something more committed just yet. Is there an age difference? It's nine years. He's older? Yeah. 
So he's a little skittish. It seems like it. One of my questions for you, Alex, would be who initiated this Chicago trip? I did. He actually was like, you should come visit sometime. You'd like it. And so I, on the fly, bought tickets. So you're worried that you are being more proactive in this relationship than he is. Yeah. That sucks. I'm sorry. Yeah, that is a little lame because, you know, you're always kind of playing catch up. But I mean, instinctually, a couple of things that jumped out for me when you were just explaining where you were at, Alex, was, first of all, people don't know what's going on in your head. You know, people ask me a lot about anxiety. You know, they're like, I'm anxious about this thing. I'm nervous to do this thing. And I always just try and point out, you know, that's fine. I understand that it's significant and it's real and it feels big anxiety. But don't get it confused that everyone else is also walking around experiencing the anxiety that you are feeling and going, oh, look at that person having really big anxiety. They're not. No one really knows what's going on in people's heads. So if you've not like spilled your guts to this guy and been extremely communicative and feel a little exposed in that regard, then I wouldn't trip yourself up on the idea of like, I'm coming at it with all of this emotion and we don't know what's going on with him. And then by that same rationale, the other thing that I would say is like, we don't know what's going on with him. Maybe he's just not the greatest communicator. Maybe he's a little conservative, maybe he's a little slower than you, you know, you might very well hang out with him in Chicago. And based on that little amount of intimate time that you spend with each other, maybe he'll be able to kind of say, hey, listen, this is where I'm feeling now. Some people are bad on the phone. Some people are bad via text. You know, I'm always getting in trouble via text because I'm very kind of blunt and sarcastic. And then I always say we should switch to audio note because then you'll understand my tone. So it might just be an in-person time thing, potentially. Alex, I think it's really interesting that when I asked about the age difference, have you been in relationships with a lot of older people? He's probably one of the more median, but yeah. Yeah. I want you to get the power back in yourself. Yeah. Not necessarily in the relationship, but I wish I could reframe this trip to Chicago as you're also examining him. Yeah. You are awesome. And there's got to be a ton of like super handsome dudes that would love to be with you. Yeah. I'm just kind of echoing what you're saying there, Anna, because I think that's good advice. Like being in your power is kind of key. And some of the ways that you can do that, because again, no one knows what's going on in your head. Just try and affect like a lightness about the weekend. Yes. You know? Have a glass of wine, have dinner, go for a walk, see what happens, be impulsive, enjoy it. I mean, if you're reading him and he does want to get into some deep and meaningfuls and he does want to have that extra glass of wine too many or spend an extra hour in an intimate setting to have that conversation, that's just fine. But if he doesn't, if he's coming from a place of keeping it light too, sometimes being a mirror to that person in an intimate situation like that, especially when you're still getting to know someone, can give you that power back because you're like, look, I'm not overexerting myself. He isn't either. I'm kind of just meeting him where he wants me to be. And because of that, this guy's like, oh, he's being respectful of my emotions, of what I'm comfortable with. That can be a cool way of getting a little bit of the power back. I think that is an excellent idea because I bet with your history, you guys had a ton of intense talks. And so you're like loaded with the anticipation of more intense talks. Yeah. Where are we? Where are we going? What's going to happen with us? I love you. I don't know if you love me. This doesn't have to be a jump off the high dive. Yeah, I like that idea. And also, like Anna said, I've been in that situation before. I've really been crushing on someone and I've got the impression that they're not crushing on me. And I have all these great intentions of like, keep it light, keep it airy, have some fun. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes you get carried away. But in looking back at the times where I've come away from those weekends and thought, you know what, I played that just perfectly. The best way to do it is just be a mirror. Just see how they're feeling, see where their head's at, mirror their behavior, and don't overexert. Because those are times where you're going to cringe late and go, oh, I shouldn't have said that, I kind of ruined it. Just be in flow with your friend and just have fun. Okay. I can do that. I like that advice. It's nerve wracking because like when you've had a spotty history with other men as well, it's like first shot at something nice and it's like, whoa. So yeah, I agree with Dom about mirroring and just seeing how the flow goes. And how recent was the divorce? 
When we first met, it was probably like three or four months. So it was very soon afterwards. That's when you're like, who am I? Am I free? Am I scarred? Am I embarrassed? Or am I proud? There's like a total untethering. So my goal for you is your happiness. Yeah. You've had a lot happen to you. And you're probably Mm -hmm. very used to love through drama. Mm -hmm. I feel you. I feel like the 20s is just like extremely intense and I'm just about to be out of it. Part of me is nervous, part of me is not, but I'm just like ready for the new feelings to become just steady. Steady, yeah, which will be hard for you. It will be hard for you to recognize the steadiness. You'll feel a little bored. You'll feel comparative. These are normal. Yeah. Were you more hurt than he was with the ending of the relationship? Well, I think we were both equally as devastated because he just felt really bad that he felt like he had let me down. And I was just like more than happy that he was just vulnerable and honest about where he was. I just want to make sure that you can balance the idea of protecting your heart and also being confident in your own feelings. Yeah, I think I can do it. Yeah. And I bet that you're an amazing partner to somebody. I bet that you're loyal. I bet that you're generous. You have a lot to offer. Yeah, thank you. Alex, I know that you have this. I don't know if he's the perfect person for you, but I want you to have an awesome time in Chicago. Yeah. And if this guy breaks your heart, it's a noble scar. Yeah, not the end of the room. That's right. Not at all. You both are in transitory places right now. Yeah. And you're ambitious. You know, you've got things to do. Yeah. I want you to have a really good time. Of course. Totally understand everything that you and Dom are both talking about. Really, 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 really helps. Good. And it's kind of lessen the anxiety. Oh, good. Lovely. Alex, I'm thinking about you. Thank you so much. Alex, good luck to you on your weekend. Thank you. Bye. Dom, I cannot thank you enough. It's been so fun. You are just wonderful. I really appreciate all of your insight and your honesty and your stories. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. That's very sweet. It was really great hanging out. It's great to see you. 